Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor James Falls, who is Professor of Physics at Northwestern University. He is also co-director of the Center for Applied Physics and Superconducting Technologies at Northwestern. Welcome, Jim. Uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So um, I have to warn you, Jim, uh, before you start, um, I was uh, at Northwestern in the mid 80s in engineering school, uh, but since then I have lost most of my engineering. So, mm-hmm. so I have to ask you some, some basic questions on our topics today. Um, mm-hmm. And so I want to start with um, a, a press release. Um, it's, uh, it says here, dirty superconductors make better particle accelerators. And so this is from last year. Um, You say, we show how impurities can increase the maximum accelerating field of superconducting radio frequency cavities, a finding with huge potential cost savings. Now, so superconductors are are these things that can conduct electricity with with almost no resistance. Um, But what is superconducting radio frequency cavities? Very good. They're, uh, they're superconductors in the shape of a cavity. So they're, um, you actually pump out all of the air of the interior of the superconductor. Um, think of it as uh, um, something like an ellipsoid. And uh, the typical sizes will be uh, you know, on the order of, uh, of uh, a meter to a half a meter. Uh, some of them are smaller. And the material that... Uh, uh, is used in its uh, Fermi lab for building uh, superconducting radio frequency cavities. We call them SRF cavities for short. Yeah. Uh, is a is a mater- is a metal pure niobium. Uh, it's niobium, um, mm. an elemental superconductor. Uh, it's uh, it's easy to uh, uh, relatively easy to manufacture uh, sheets of uh, this uh, metal and uh, shape it into the geometries you want. And uh, there's a lot of engineering that goes into designing the shape of these cavities for the purpose of uh, supporting uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, rate of waves inside of the cavity. Oh, okay. And so, so, so you get superconducting phenomenon only in the cavity? No, the superconductivity um, acts to... Uh, uh, so let me just uh, say the the uh, the purpose of these cavities is yeah. is uh, you string them together and um, if you put charged particles if you inject charged particles electrons or protons into the cavity the electric field um, <clears throat> of an electromagnetic wave in the cavity w- can accelerate the charged particles uh, through the cavity. And uh, what you do is you string many of these these uh, uh, these uh, uh, cavities together, and you coordinate the direction of the 
electric field that provides a force on the charged particles such that <clears throat> as they go from cavity to cavity, they, they get an additional kick, they get an additional force. And so that way you're allowed to, you're able to accelerate the charged particles uh, through through the cavity that makes up the accelerator. For example, the Tevatron at Fermilab are the are the uh, uh, the <clears throat> are the uh, accelerator at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. Yeah. Now the yeah. the superconductor, <clears throat> its purpose is the the it it is to shield and prevent the electromagnetic field from escaping the walls of the cavity. And superconductivity is is the is the physics behind how you can find the field inside the vacuum of the accelerator. Okay, and so uh, the the Large Hadron Collider, uh, really big machine, very expensive. So so this idea would this help? Uh, I know that there has been some um, some ideas around desktop uh, accelerators. So could you make um, you know, sort of very small versions of a particle accelerator using this? Uh, yes, in fact, um, uh, at the Fermi National Accelerator Lab, they design um, uh, SRF cavities and accelerators for many different purposes beyond just uh, uh, doing fundamental physics uh, at very large facilities like, uh, like the LHC or the Tevatron or SLAC. So there are commercial uh, uses for uh, for particle accelerators that uh, you've used uh, as technology for uh, for medical studies um, to get charged particles or radiation to to uh, uh, mitigate uh, uh, cancerous tissues and so forth. In some cases, there, there's a lot of uses for uh, for accelerators. Will these uh, allow uh, sort of the Experiments that have been conducted at LHC, um, or that has been planned, or this will be a, in a sort of a different commercial direction. Uh, besides the LHC, and uh, in the future uh, direction for next generation particle accelerators for fundamental physics, for scale up, not not down. Um, yeah. And it's a matter of uh, of. Of just how much you can accelerate the particles and get them up to high enough energy, so that you can explore regions of physics that haven't been explored before. So uh, the next generation of uh, upgrade of LHC or the next generation of of uh, uh, international colliders will will be larger scale or on a different design than a circular um, than than a circular uh, accelerator such as LHC. So uh, the Japanese government is considering building a high-powered linear accelerator in the future, yeah. and uh, Fermi National La uh, Accelerator Lab is going to be involved in designing uh, uh, the SRF cavities for that accelerator. So the linear accelerators, um, rather than the, 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 the circular one that we have in Geneva, so, so how how big will that axle, well, what's the length of that linear accelerator that's being planned? Oh, yeah. So I'm not the expert on the, the, on the Japanese machine, but uh, the one at Slack is on the order of kilometers long. Oh, okay, okay. And so, so this technology, um, you say here that, um, uh, the, how impurities can increase the maximum accelerating field. So this is, this is sort of new, right? Um, so you, you mentioned niobium as sort of the substrate that's being used. So, so what's the mechanism here? What, what, what are the impurities we're talking about? Yes, okay. Um, so uh, in order to uh, kind of uh, get this correct, uh, and I'll give you the flavor of what's going on here, I have to tell you how it is that you, uh, su superconductors have a, a, an important property beyond the fact that they can conduct electricity without dual heating. Um, yeah. That's, <clears throat> and that's even not entirely the, the case, uh, which I'll come back to. As I, uh, as I said earlier, the function of superconductivity is to confine the electromagnetic field inside the vacuum of the cavity so that you can accelerate charged particles. Yeah. And 
the mechanism by which superconductors do that is called the Meissner effect. And uh, in a nutshell, it's this. If you take a metal such as niobium and you apply a magnetic field when it's at a temperature above its superconducting transition, when it's just a normal metal, the magnetic field will penetrate through the metal yeah. um, completely. So you'll just basically have a homogeneous magnetic field penetrating the metal. But as you cool that metal, niobium, below the superconducting transition, the field inside the metal will be excluded completely <laughs> and, uh, and pushed out uh, out of the superconductor. And this is, was discovered in the 1930s by Meissner and Oxenfeld. And uh, it's a, one of the defining properties of a superconductor. But you ask yourself, uh, how does that happen? Well, in order to screen the field, what happens is a current flows on the boundary of the superconductor and exactly balances out the external field that would be penetrating it. Yeah. So in this case, it would be the uh, magnetic electric and mag it would be the magnetic field inside the uh, cavity of the accelerator. Hmm. Now, if you push those currents too hard, namely if you make the field strength too high, a superconductivity fails and breaks down. Right. Then, the, then, the, then the function of the cavity fails and your whole accelerator shuts down. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> you know, you're, you tend to think that you hear about superconductors and you say they can conduct electricity uh, without any joule heating. And that's true. Uh, these are called persistent currents, but it's only true under DC conditions. Right. If you have an AC current, uh, then um, they, there are two types of electrons. There are the superconducting electrons and those that have not yet joined the superconducting state, and mm -hmm. those are subject to ohmic dissipation. Right. So what you want to do is completely minimize that dissipation, and then you want to maximize the the, the critical current that the superconductor can achieve. So that's what, uh, that's what uh, my colleague, uh, Wave uh, Nam Budicorn and I uh, worked on was, what are the conditions under which we can improve the maximum critical field, that can, or <clears throat> critical field that can be sustained uh, for the superconductor in the Meissner state? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is called the superheating field. Uh, because the accelerator is operating right at its maximum limit. And uh, the superheating field is when, the, when, when you have an absolute catastrophic failure of the superconductor. What we found was that a uh, surprising thing is that if you introduce impurities, built impurities into the surface of the superconductor, you do decrease the critical current right on the boundary but you increase the region in which the field can penetrate into the into the superconductor, but still be confined. Right. And uh, and that was the that was the finding. We could increase the superheating field and therefore the ma maximum accelerating field in the cavity by introducing impurities um, graded in a gradient or diffused into the surface of the of the material. It's a it's a bit counterintuitive, <laughs> right? So, so, so you say impurity diffusion layers predict an increase in the superheating field as high as thirty five percent. So, uh, th these are some specific kind of impurities, or what's the process by which you would create them? So the uh, uh, the experiments that have been done at Fermilab, uh, the big discovery was that if you doped or if you uh, you introduce nitrogen impurities into niobium in uh, low concentrations in in this uh, graded form uh, you would incre you increase not only the quality factor of the cavity uh, how good a resonator it is but also the maximum accelerating field so they now have maximum accelerating fields up to i think roughly 49 megavolts per meter that's still below the theoretical limit we predict. So there's there's still uh, the opportunity for improvements in optimizing the experimental conditions for even better cavities. And and what's the temperature um, that that uh, you know the the system will be at for this? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite uh, get get the question. 
that uh, you know this process happens. Yeah. So uh, the audio broke up. I didn't hear the first part of the question. Yeah. So so I was wondering what temperature, what uh, you know, what ambient temperature do we have for? Uh, the... Yes. Very good. Well, this is an important point. Good question. Um, the superconductor uh, niobium becomes a superconductor um, just below about uh, nine Kelvin degrees, nine degrees above absolute zero. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's actually a fairly high temperature for cryogenic purposes because uh, liquid helium, uh, uh, helium is liquefied at four Kelvin, and uh, most of the experiments are done uh, at around two Kelvin. So yeah. that's at a temperature that's still very low below the critical temperature of niobium, so that it is in, it's in a very good low temperature superconducting state. Okay, uh, my um, I, I haven't followed the field, Jim, but um, in terms of just superconductivity, um, we are you know much higher than uh, a few kelvins, right? I thought we were sort of in the hundreds of kelvins. That's right. You know, we're now uh, uh, high temperature superconductors, uh, which are more complicated uh, materials. They're compounds. For example, the, the cuprates are made out of copper and oxygen and other yeah. materials like lanthanum or, or barium and uh, strontium. But they're all perovskite uh, materials and the superconductivity occurs in the copper oxygen planes. Mm -hmm. and those uh, superconductors can, depending upon which family and exactly the processing steps, uh, I think the highest TCs are now around 130 Kelvin or so. But, but uh, they have... Uh, they have other properties that are not um, that are not ideal for uh, for building accelerators. Okay. So okay. So then that involves things like you know how well do they conduct heat? Um, do they? One of the key things about niobium is is that once you cool it below its superconducting transition, an energy gap opens up um, that <clears throat> separates. Um, that basically uh, makes it very hard to create any broken, uh, any non-superconducting electron. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, the, the number of non-superconducting electrons will be exponentially suppressed if you have an uh, excitation gap everywhere uh, on the surface, of what is called the Fermi surface of the metal. Yeah, uh, that's a really key property uh, because it, it gives rise to extremely low dissipation of the superconductor. And that's where the cost savings comes in. Uh, it really costs a lot of uh, uh, these are big cryogenic facilities that have to keep an accelerator um, cool below its superconducting transition when it's under operation at full power. So uh, so so making. And so uh, SRF cavities with higher quality factors, namely lower surface resistance, is really crucial uh, because it uh, it reduces the, the cost in cryogenic uh, cooling tremendously. Okay, so, so the application here is uh, somewhat specific to particle accelerators. Uh, is it, uh, was the discovery sort of accidental that um, when you get this nitrogen impurity, things change? Yes, yes. Uh, my colleague Anna Grassolino uh, at Fermilab, um, uh, they do lots of studies, but uh, it was sort of an Edisonian approach to, uh, to trying to improve the performance uh, of the accelerator cavities. They did various studies where they, uh, they had either oxygen or they had uh, uh, sometimes carbon or nitrogen. They did many different studies, and they found that under a set of processing steps where you introduce concentrations of nitrogen, that it increased the quality factor of these cavities uh, by, by almost a factor of two. So they went up to quality factors of order four times 10 to the power 11. Uh, let me put that in perspective for, our, for, for your listeners. Uh, these, these cavities, uh, when they're under operation as electromagnetic cavities, they're the best man-made resonators in the world. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, think of your watch keeping time and um, uh, or think of a pendulum oscillating and, uh, uh, you know, Galileo's pendulum, uh, uh, 
Galileo's pendulum had a quality factor of probably 10 or 20. <laughs> and if it had been put in motion um, 400 years ago and it had a quality factor of 10 to the 11, it would have only lost about 20% of its amplitude today. <laughs> That's how good these resonators are. So, uh, right. so they're really tremendous. The only thing better are atomic clocks. Yeah. <laughs> So they're a really tremendous uh, technology uh, innovation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you are you are a co-director of the Center for Applied Physics and Superconducting Technology. So this is a collaboration between Fermilab and Northwestern. That's right. It it, it started with uh, our colleagues at Fermilab who were on the experimental and technology side, and after the discovery of uh, nitrogen doping uh, and its improvement, they wanted to to see if there, there could be more um, directed approaches on improving performance uh, by, by bringing in uh, experts on, uh, on superconductivity from the materials and theory point, point of view. So that's how this collaboration started was, was uh, we, have a, we have a strong group in experimental superconductivity at Northwestern and we have a, a group in, in the theory of superconductivity, including myself, uh, who've formed this collaboration with Fermilab. And, and our Office of Research and Fermi National Accelerator Lab seated, seated our center, and uh, that's how we got going. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's at the intersection of material science and physics. Um, it seems like it's a, it's a good, good position to be in uh, with the Fermilab Northwestern combination. It is. It, it's, been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. I never had done anything like this myself. I've always been kind of an ivory tower theorist. But, then, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's been a, a pleasure to work on problems uh, that are driven by improving technology today. So, uh, so it's been a very exciting run. Um, you talk about, uh, as part of uh, CAPST, uh, other areas here, uh, quantum information, science, medicine, uh, and so on. Uh, can you give a bit of a color on, you know, what are the things that you're working on in those areas? Yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about our, our newest ventures, which are in the area of, of uh, quantum information science, specifically quantum computing uh, yeah. and uh, quantum sensing, or building detectors that are, that are extremely sensitive or detecting whatever, uh, dark matter, for example. Yeah, uh, so uh, one of the leading, if not the leading technology that's, being, um, that's been developed for um, building quantum computers, namely computers that take advantage of, of uh, quantum uh, mechanics and quantum logic elements. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the, the analog of a, of a bit in a classical computer is called a qubit. And uh, the physical realization uh, of a qubit is, is an electrical, is a circuit uh, involving uh, a superconducting circuit involving, uh, you know, things like a capacitors and uh, inductors, but in particular, a special device that is due to superconductivity called the Josephson Tunnel Junction. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, these devices, when you when you cool them down below their superconducting transition, they behave like atoms that have quantized energy levels, um, just like an atom. And uh, you can uh, excite and address those, um, those states of the quantum circuit with microwave photons. Hmm. So uh, that's where the resonators come in. The huh. resonators become the devices by which you can communicate with your atoms. In this case, your your your, uh, your quantum circuit. Right, right. So, so uh, superconductors play a role both in uh, storing quantum information in the form of of states of these uh, qubits, these superconducting qubits. And my colleague at Northwestern, uh, Jens Koch, was the co-developer developer of the of the qubit called the Transmon that is used worldwide. It's used by Google. Uh, IBM, uh, the Yale group, uh, everywhere. Um, and it is exactly what I said. It's, a, it's a, a, an elementary circuit made of superconductors and a device called a Josephson tunnel junction. Yeah. 
Uh, I know that Google demonstrated something recently. Uh, IBM demonstrated something, uh, uh, some uh, quantum computing uh, capabilities. Uh, the the issue, uh, I don't know much about it, Jim, but uh, it, it's uh, the issue is uh, from a practical perspective, how many qubits uh, you can get right into a system and how stable they are and so on. Are, are those the issues? Uh, yeah, from those are the key issues is uh, there's, <clears throat> There's the scale of how many how many qubits you can uh, build into your into your machine that can also uh, perform uh, logic operations. Yeah, and uh, the ability to be able to uh, to produce uh, to set gates and to read them out. Um, the Google machine that was that <clears throat> announced the the achievement of quantum supremacy back in October of last year. Um, that was, um, that was a group headed by John Martinez, who's now at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And uh, that machine had 53 of these transmon qubits. Yeah. And, uh, but, super, but quantum computers gain advantage exponentially uh, as you scale the number of qubits. You know? right. so, uh, so even at 53 qubits, um, for a particular algorithm is not particularly useful for our point of view of practical computations, uh, outperforms uh, the best supercomputer in the world, uh, <clears throat> the Summit machine at Oak Ridge. And uh, uh, so, yes, yeah, so <clears throat> uh, they, uh, you know, that, that's kind of, we're, we're right at the cusp of uh, moving into the territory where we can build machines that can actually perform useful computations uh, yeah. using quantum, quantum logic elements. So this is the regime, regime of what's called quantum advantage. So we may be able to, in the, within the five-year period, solve problems um, that we really uh, could not otherwise solve even for using large supercomputers. What so, would be the number of qubits that you need, Jim, to, to say we have a we sort of a practical machine. Uh, we're we're shooting uh, in our new center for um, uh, superconducting uh, um, quantum materials and systems, which is uh, our, our mission. Our our main goal and our mission is to build uh, uh, a beyond state of the art uh, quantum computer uh, that outperforms, uh, for example, the the uh, Sycamore uh, machine at Google. Uh, so it, um, in our new center for superconducting quantum materials and, and systems, uh, our, our mission is to build a next generation uh, quantum computer in the five-year time frame that will uh, outperform uh, the current state of the art and move us into the, reg the region of quantum advantage. Yeah. So uh, uh, we're, we're uh, uh, collaborating with Rigetti Computing in Berkeley, uh, Fermi National Accelerator Lab at uh, uh, here in in Chicago and in Northwestern and Ames Lab, uh, yeah. with a number of other partners in this center. We have uh, we have twenty institutional partners and eighty um, eighty science investigators, uh, and it's a it's a broad program from material science to uh, to uh, to to manufacturing and scaling up, build a device, yeah. uh, build a machine. And uh, that's where the expertise for building large technology programs at Fermilab is really, really essential for this. Rigetti Computing is really essential because they have all of the, they have the fabrication facilities and the know-how to, to do um, uh, full-scale quantum, build quantum computers. And uh, Northwestern and Ames have the material science background to improve the performance of the of the qubits for the for this the next generation. Um, and our our mission has really been to attack the problem uh, of what we call decoherence, namely the time scale on which a qubit can actually perform useful um, logic operations. Right. Um, so um, that time scale. Uh, is really uh, 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 the frontier of which we're tackling, uh, and we're really aiming at getting a, a tenfold improvement in coherence times for qubits 
and uh, also in designing new new um, uh, different geometries uh, and architectures for for uh, for machines. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, uh, that that is our approach, and we we we're projecting that we can build a machine in a five year time frame that uh, operates with 100 to 150. Uh, qubits uh, with higher performance, and uh, this will move us into the regime for actually doing uh, computationally useful um, uh, calculations on uh, using quantum logic. Yeah, that, that's exciting. So as you mentioned, um, the, the performance uh, capabilities sort of increase exponentially. Sounds like there are two dimensions. One is the number of qubits, and the other is sort of the, I don't know the right, right term, would be sort of latency and decoherence, or how, how long it can actually hold. Yes, that's right. So we want to improve the time scale in which, um, the coherence time on which we can actually perform uh, computations with, with, uh, with, our, with these qubits. So a tenfold increase would, would uh, translate into a substantial increase in, the, in our computational power. Hmm. And so uh, this is collaboration then, Jim. Uh, it is actually going to create something that is practical and it's, it's like a physical machine that can be rolled out with the, the, those types of performance characteristics. Yes, and we're going to make it, it, it uh, we're going to make it available to the wider community to take it, take use of it and uh, and 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 uh, program it and and uh, do do calculations on it. That's our goal. Who has the who has the fastest supercomputer today? Is it in China? Uh, that I don't know. Who's the fastest? That's <laughs> uh, and it's it's hard to get actually precise information on that. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, we're the, the there are new and there there are different architectures for building quantum computers. Uh, the yeah. the one I think you're referring to is based on on ion traps. And uh, that uh, that technology, I'm not really as familiar with. Uh, and there are advantages and disadvantages to using uh, different technologies, and we're we're really laser focused on using superconductors uh, and quantum circuits because we can engineer them. Uh, that's one of the real key advantages: is that we can design our circuits, uh, we can manufacture them on a chips or we can build them into three-dimensional architectures using um, using 3D SRF cavities. So, so at 150 qubits and performance improvement in terms of decoherence uh, timelines, uh, are we talking about many, many orders of um, improvement from conventional computing? Uh, Yes, we are. We're talking about doing uh, computations uh, that uh, really can't be achieved on on current current supercomputers using classical machines. So that's the that's the region which I termed quantum advantage. Yeah. So yeah. we have a uh, we have a group in a, in our center who are really experts in this. They're they're uh, they're much more oriented towards developing. Uh, algorithms and uh, computational codes that can take advantage of a specific architecture. So that's a whole uh, thrust area of our center. It involves uh, uh, it, it involves uh, mathematicians and uh, and uh, and computational experts at NASA Ames um, and uh, at Fermilab and uh, and a few of our key uh, smaller partners who are real experts in this particular area. Yeah, there is a whole uh, hardware side of it, and then there is a whole software side of it. That's right? right. That's right. And we have we have both, and we have real experts in both areas. My own area is more on the hardware side and uh, and and on the material side, but also in the area of uh, thinking about how one can use these devices for for um, for doing fundamental physics, because that's a major mission at Fermi National Accelerator Lab is their accelerator lab to probe uh, big questions about uh, what's the nature of uh, our universe and what's the nature of matter. So, uh, so one driver in our center is, uh, is, is how do we take advantage of, of quantum technologies and quantum device technologies uh, in order to build better detectors uh, for yeah. rare events such as you know, the passage of 
of uh, dark matter through uh, through a particular apparatus. So uh, that's one of our other drivers is is doing fundamental physics with uh, new technologies. Yeah, um, just a quick question uh, on the quantum computing side again, Jim. So did it feel like sort of a massively parallel process machine or it's going to behave very differently? Well, that's the quantum advantage uh, that that you get from using qubits is that in, in a sense you, you have massive parallel parallelization built into the coupling of many qubits together. So uh, a, a, a way to think about it is that uh, if you have a single classical bit, uh, it can uh, it, it's either a one or a zero. Um, uh, but the a quantum bit uh, can be in a superposition of the one and zero. So uh, so if you can do one uh, uh, one computational operation on a bit, you can do two computational operations on a qubit. Now, if you can couple, uh, say, two qubits together, that gives you four possible operations you can do with two qubits uh, and two with uh, two classical bits. So by the time you, if you get three qubits and you can uh, uh, couple them together to do uh, computations, entangle them, then you can do eight computations. And you can see it goes exponentially with a number of qubits. So by the time you're at 53 qubits, you have a, you have a lot of computational advantage because it goes as, as two to the power n. So long as you can maintain uh, the superposition uh, and entanglement of your of your qubits. So those are the challenges. Uh, but will the, any kind of the coding expertise translate from conventional computing? You, you talked about algorithms and mathematics. Uh, that's going to be different. But will, will anything translate from conventional computing? Uh, no, this is this is a real frontier area, and um, uh, we don't have the same kind of body of codes that will take advantage of uh, of uh, the architecture of of quantum machines. So. The whole area of algorithm development is a really important one, and it's it's one of the really growth fields here. Is once we have these machines, how are we going to uh, make use of them? So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, new codes have to be written, uh, and they have to be written to the specific architecture of the machine. Yeah, and and uh, it's uh, sometimes difficult to look too far into the future, but. When they become sort of prevalent um, in the economy, uh, they will supersede completely, right? Conventional computing. If, if the cost of manufacturing is not substantially different, wouldn't it make conventional computing completely obsolete? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, uh, because, uh, I mean, for many, for many of our, uh, the things that we do, uh, classical computers are quite good. So we may be able to set up and provide data to a, a, a quantum computer using uh, classical computers to interface to them. So um, once we have the data from a computation, then we can analyze it with a classical computer. So I'd, I don't see that classical computers are going to be disappearing in the, in the, in the future. We're, and we're not going to be carrying around our iPhones with a quantum computer in them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. That, is, that is just a matter of time. So. Uh, yeah, so, that's right. Sorry. Uh, anybody who wants to predict the future, yeah, do it at your own risk. Yeah. <laughs> so, so conceptually, will it feel like, you know, sort of the pre-processing and post-processing uh, done by conventional computing and, and really, you know, the heart of the, the heavy um, number crunching done by a quantum computer will it will it feel like that? Uh, well, that's the way I I envision it. At least uh, that's that's the way it looks to me. Uh, but yeah. uh, you know, time will tell. So, <laughs> right. yeah, I I want to get into one other paper. Um, it's it's entitled "Take a Dip into the Weird World of a World of Quantum Liquids." Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Quantized, <laughs> quantized this is, as you say here. So, so what is quantum liquid, liquids? So there, um, uh, my area is particularly in the area of, of, uh, of helium. So helium is, uh, you know, the 
the simplest of the inert uh, gas atoms, it's the light mass. Um, it, uh, it's a really special, uh, the, the whole set of inert gas atoms uh, have closed electronic shells. And so there's virtually little chemistry involved at all in helium. And it's the only substance um, that we have, the um, only material that we have that remains liquid down to the absolute zero of temperature. Yeah. So um, uh, they're remarkable. Uh, as you cool um, uh, helium down, uh, there, there, are two, there are two isotopes of helium as well, although a common garden variety isotope is called helium-4. Uh, yeah. It has atomic number four uh, because the nucleus is made out of uh, two protons and two neutrons. And uh, bound around the atom is two electrons. So this, this atom in its ground state um, is really quite inert. It has, uh, and it has zero um, electronic or nuclear spin. So um, in, the, in the context of particle uh, types, uh, it's, it's a boson. It obeys uh, what are called Bose statistics. Uh, yeah. Whereas the light isotope of helium, which is missing a neutron, but is still a stable nucleus, uh, is a spin one half fermion. And so uh, chemically, uh, they're virtually identical. It's just one is slightly lighter mass than the other. But, but yeah. when you cool them down to low temperatures, <clears throat> uh, they, uh, there's a, a temperature called the degeneracy point uh, where quantum mechanics takes over macroscopically among all of the atoms. And hmm. it's when the wave properties of an individual helium atom, um, when the wavelength of that uh, particle becomes larger than the interparticle spacing, then you have to take into account the indistinguishability of these par all of these identical helium atoms. And that's the so-called hmm. quantum regime, uh, the regime in hmm. which these these liquids behave as quantum liquids with radically different properties than a classical liquid. Hmm. <clears throat> Helium-4, which I said is a Bose particle, it undergoes a, a, a transition which was predicted by Einstein in 1925 uh, after he was reading a paper by, by Bose who had sent it to uh, a Zeitschrift der Physik and uh, Einstein got it to review, and uh, it was Bose's paper on the statistics of photons, which are yeah. also Bose particles. And uh, Einstein realized that uh, he, he took it from there, and he said, well, what if we had particles that had mass that were also bosons? And pre he predicted that there would be a new phase transition, even for, for non-interacting bosons. And that was the prediction of what is now called the Bose-Einstein condensation point. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this, um, so what are the sort of the unique properties? So it, this stays liquid uh, at very close to absolute zero, right? Uh, so, so what are the properties um, of this? Yeah. When you, um, when you become, when helium four, which becomes uh, a, uh, a Bose liquid below about two degrees Kelvin, it becomes a superfluid. It will flow yeah. just just like a superconducting, a superconducting electrons can flow without resistance, the liquid itself will flow without viscosity or without dissipation. So you could imagine uh, setting up uh, the, a fluid flow in a toroidal ring and the, and the fluid will just continue uh, flowing uh, indefinitely. Um, and that's the, that's the persistent current or the superfluid state of helium-4. So uh, uh, helium-3 also becomes a superfluid, but at much, much lower temperatures, so about a thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. Hmm. So, so, so what are the applications? Do you see some practical applications for it? Um, no, it's, uh, it's really uh, the helium liquids for um, the most part have just been uh, the great gift to, uh, to physicists because we learn so much about uh, the about how quantum mechanics operates in matter uh, based on on the studies of these liquids 
they they are the paradigm for understanding uh, superconductivity, superfluidity, uh, even metals physics. They were at the heart of understanding uh, the basic properties of metals. Metals themselves, even at room temperature, are quantum liquids. The electrons are well below the degeneracy point, and they they behave uh, collectively as a as a um, quantum liquid. And the helium liquids were. Um, uh, in many ways, um, a paradigm for understanding this behavior. So, so, so just mechanistically, as you cool this down, when it gets to superfluid, helium-4, uh, it, it never turns into solid. So uh, is it reasonable to assume that whatever gets to a superfluid state will never go much further from there yeah you get to uh, if you if you go to if, as you approach absolute zero uh the liquid just becomes a pure superfluid and there are no excitations it's it's basically in its ground state it's as um mm. motionless as is as you possibly can make it except if you put it in motion it will flow collectively without dissipation right right yeah. So, so you note here, uh, Jim, that a deeper understanding of the uh, uh, deeper understanding the physics of superfluids has implications for other scientific pursuits, including astronomy. Mm. Uh, you say, for instance, it's thought based on observations of pulsars and extensive theoretical studies that superfluids make the interiors of dense, compact stars made mostly of neutrons or neutron stars. And so, so if you can understand, you know, the properties of superfluid, you think it has implications for maybe a better understanding of how neutron stars behave and pulsars and those types of things. Yes, that's um, in fact our current theoretical uh, understanding is that uh, neutron stars and pulsars are indeed at temperatures well below these degeneracy points, and they become superfluids. Neutrons um, are spin one half uh, fermions, just like the helium three atom is, and uh, they have attractive forces uh, between them, nuclear forces that that can bind them up into pairs, uh, just like electron pairs in a superconductor, and just like helium three atoms in superfluid helium three. So they undergo a type of Bose condensation. It's called BCS condensation or bardeen cooper schrieffer condensation. And become superfluids below this uh, below this transition point. So uh, we actually best estimates are is that uh, the neutrons in the interior of neutron stars, once the temperature goes below about <clears throat> about ten, uh, ten to the eighth Kelvin in in the interior of a star, uh, they become superfluid. So you may <laughs> think that ten to the eighth Kelvin is uh, a rather high temperature, but you have to compare that interior temperature with the degeneracy temperature of the matter, which is about 10 to the 12th Kelvin. So uh, when neutron stars are born uh, in, uh, in supernova events, they're created at extremely high temperatures, maybe 10 to the 13 Kelvin, and uh, <clears throat> they cool extremely rapidly by, by the uh, liberation of uh, neutrinos from the interior of the star, which, which takes the energy away and cools them. So uh, yeah. they cool yeah. very rapidly. They cool below 10 to the 10th Kelvin probably in, uh, in uh, uh, a thousand years or so. So yeah. most of the pulsars that uh, we observe are really uh, quite cold. And uh, comparatively yeah, speaking, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, so you see here, Jim, also beyond the matter inside neutron stars, we just talked about. One candidate for the unseen dark matter, which is uh, approximately 25% uh, of the universe, you're saying that in the universe is a quantum state of light mass particles that forms a cosmic superfluid. So, so this is sort of a hypothesis. It's not my can... hypothesis, but uh, it's one of the yeah. proposals for what is what dark matter might be is uh, light mass uh, particles that undergo uh, condensation to form a, a cosmic superfluid. So uh, I, it sounds wild, uh, and it really is a wild <laughs> even from my, from my point of view, but, uh, but uh, one of the big open questions in physics is uh, uh, we have good evidence from gravitational observations of galaxies, uh, galaxy structure and so forth, is that there's 
more mass than we can account for just by observing it um, yeah. uh, through uh, electromagnetic signals. So we believe there's a, a significant amount of mass that is in the form of uh, what we call dark matter, and we'd like to know what it is. Is it something really new? Um, is there any way in which it weakly interacts with ordinary matter, protons and, and uh, electrons and, and so forth? <clears throat> is there a weak electromagnetic coupling? So that's one of the things we're doing in our, our Center for uh, um, uh, Superconducting uh, Quantum Materials and Systems is, is um, seeing if we can, these new detectors that we're uh, developing based on superconductors uh, with very high sensitivity uh, can find uh, very weak signals associated with uh, various proposals for dark matter. So, uh, so that's one of the, the things that we're doing also in the center. We're looking for other candidates like what are called the dark photon, which is a cousin of the photon. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for other particles called the axion. Um, and yeah. so uh, that's, a, that's a really exciting uh, uh, scientific driver for uh, developing these technologies. So, so if dark matter were a superfluid, then uh, the properties, the new properties that we could seek that we haven't been really looking for? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I think one of the proposals is that, uh, uh, so superfluids can have defects in them. And those defects yeah. are uh, are properties of the macroscopic uh, quantum mechanical state of the superfluid, and those defects uh, are called quantized vortices. So, uh, yeah. so there are, and th they have a, a mathematical property which uh, uh, <clears throat> makes them very stable. They're they're they have a topological property that is, that is very hard, that can't be undone easily. So uh, mm. um, depending upon uh, how fast the, the universe uh, is cooled during the early days of its expansion, if there was uh, such a state that formed, it may have formed under the conditions of a rapid quench, in which case there would be lots yeah. of topological defects formed uh, in this, uh, this uh, hypothesized uh, uh, cosmic superfluid. So, what are the mm -hmm. what are the consequences of having all of these topological defects present? How would we uh, how would we uh, know that they were there? How what what role would they play in, in in cosmology? I think those are still largely open questions. Yeah, yeah. So, so Jim, in conclusion. Um, what are the things that you're most excited about? Uh, stuff that's happening at uh, at uh, CAPST. Uh, talked about a lot of different areas that um, that companies are coming together uh, to make practical applications in. But uh, if you were to pick one or two uh, of those areas, where do you think we will make the the biggest, you know, sort of leaps in the next five to ten years? I think we're going to. Uh, I think we have a very good road to. Uh producing higher coherence uh, uh, qubits and, uh, and higher performing uh, microwave resonators for quantum detectors. I think those are the two areas that I, I, I think uh, we have the tools and we have the, uh, the expertise to really make progress on a five-year time scale. So I think we'll see next generation quantum devices with much higher performance in five years and, uh, and including the building of a of a full-scale uh, quantum computer at Fermilab. Right, yeah. It's exciting. Uh, this has been great, Jim. Thanks so much for well, spending time Gil. with me. Thank you, Gil. I appreciate it. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.